And this is Turning the Corner, where we will touch a, a little bit on the twists and turns of creating a studio, creating a game, and evolving within an industry. And for that, the people you're really interested in hearing from are esteemed panelists. So, Katie Yoon, Daniel Kajui, and Michael Carpenter. And why don't you guys just give a quick 30-second uh, intro of yourselves. Uh, yes, uh, I'm Kei Yun from Bagel Code, and uh, we are small startup based in Seoul, Korea, and developing social casino game called Vegas Party Slots, which is just released about uh, five months ago. And uh, we are published by Big Fish Games, and um, now we are about 20, 30 top grossing chart in both platform and mobile, and um, we're heading, yeah. yeah. Hi, I'm Daniel Kajui. Um, for since late '90s, I've, I've been founders of uh, founder of three companies. Um, the first one, uh, One Gaming, which specialized in online bingo and related products, and eventually the platform uh, which we built, Maria Bingo, in 2007, with an exit at that time. Uh, subsequently, the second company was a company called, a, it's still existing today, uh, called Impress Technologies. Uh, we, which we initially set out within the real money sector and at, uh, in 2013 we shifted towards the mobile with a couple of acquisitions under our belt, namely DWIP acquisition of a Tel Aviv based uh, studio as well as Akamon, uh, Barcelona based entity which we just closed before the end of the uh, 2015 and, um, and, and currently working on a new project that I'm sure will seep through at some point. Go ahead. I'm Michael Carpenter. I'm CEO of Ruby7 Studios. Uh, we're focused on uh, social casino, providing uh, full casino uh, publishing and development for land-based casinos. Uh, we have Tropicana, Delaware North, uh, the Gala Coral Group, and Pachanga, which is a large Indian casino in California. And, and just so, uh, why don't we start with kind of a little bit of strategy and, and how you guys started. Did, did you all start with the intent of creating a social casino game? So why don't I, I think mine is probably the simplest, is at the mercy of investors and, and really running a business with, uh, with, with a lot of obligations. So our entry into the social sector was purely for the reason that we, the proliferation or the expansion of regulation within the real money sector uh, slowed down at the at the turn of 2011, and a lot of the states, as and previously anticipated, were not moving forward with uh, legalization of gaming within the United States. As such, uh, uh, we we pivoted as already being a publicly traded company to acquire our way into the social sector and that, uh, that, that resulted in three acquisitions. The first one being a small studio in Toronto called Vast Studios, uh, which, uh, which focused on hidden object games and we ended up familiarizing ourselves further uh, into that sector and uh, subsequent to that was a larger acquisition of up to, uh, with earners, up to a hundred million dollar acquisition of DWIP. It, the Tel Aviv based uh, developers of Best Casino. And then we concluded that with, a, with the Aquaman acquisition, which had a great operational infrastructure based out of Barcelona and gave us a footprint into the other one. So that was how we got introduced into the social and the rationale behind why we got into it. Michael? And for Ruby7 Studios, we, uh, our first product was actually Social Casino. Uh, the team, though, had been working for five years, focused mainly on hidden object games uh, for Big Fish and, and uh, physics games and, and et cetera. So we kind of moved that team from that focus over to Social Casino when we merged them into Ruby 7. Okay. Yeah, uh, we started as a company, but we no product to develop. So we started with uh, anything that comes in mind. and. Uh, the first project we have ever built was web cartoon platform to deliver web cartoon to Korean audience, and uh, it has about like 100k DAU. Without, uh, it will never make money. It, we were wrong. So some of the Korean web cartoon companies making like tons of money these days, but we were wrong. But you know, we 
just close the server and let's find something else. And we did develop one of the SN social, you know, uh, social network service in Korea. And uh, we also tried to build a lot of things. <laughs> and the finally, you know, we ended up with developing social casino because I personally like to play casino games. And um, it's kind of hard to find. It was really hard to find any good social casino games which can be downloadable from Korea at the time. So um, it was our challenge. So And one of the proposed when we formed the team was let's make something great in the States uh, out of nowhere. So um, the, you know, the theory there was uh, if we can make something we don't have in Korea, but we make it and we make it successful in the States, then we can later make anything so that that was our you know simple stupid try, and yeah now still I'm doing it and we finally found out it's not really easy but yeah it's kind of doable and we we'll like to do that. So so just kind of building on that with hundreds of studios and hundreds of of apps and and games in this space, what made you think then, and versus kind of like what you think now in terms of why you would be successful or how you can compete or how your product would be somehow better than what was already out there or differentiated at least. Right. Uh, we are not successful yet, but... That's, that's arguable. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, the differentiation we are making is that uh, we were one of the few first uh, Asian developer who jumped into this field so uh, we try to get as many as uh, Asian, especially Chinese or Korean social game aspects into uh, real money, uh, into social casino field in the States and also in the Western world. So, um, and for the gaming itself, uh, without, you know, the casino game isn't really about Asian audience. So it's all about, uh, you know, European or American culture. So, which, you know, uh, we need to reflect the cultural differences. You know, we hire the people here to develop that part of the game. And uh, for the part, you know, the Western audience and developers usually don't think, uh, we take some idea from Asian, you know, gaming industry and, you know, merge it into one. So that's how we make differences. Yep. Daniel? So, as you mentioned, in, 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 in the notion of first mover advantage is critical, um, notwithstanding our strategy to enter the market and looking at the various um, opportunities within the social genre, whether different verticals, um, while there's always the appetite, and I'm sure everybody is always chasing what's that next big thing, and we often, you know, um, uh, slips through our fingers or what have you. I mean, outside of the very niches like the mechanical real based games that have, have, have continued to show growth and prospect with it, our basic fundamental was when looking at the social sector was it's a maturing, rapidly maturing industry. Um, uh, we, in, unless you're, you're looking at new technologies like VR, or other things that potential has another potential for you to provide yourself with the first mover advantage later down the line, you ought to seriously consider that as a high risk item. So in that regard, our strategy end was really to acquire a first mover into the business and, and that proved to be a successful decision on our part. Um, and on the back of that, of course, you can tinker with a lot of different types of innovation when you can afford a fail-fast approach and not really, you know, go under after a few months of uh, failed tries. And Michael, you started developing, then publishing, then both. Kind of, what was your strategy all along? So, um, coming out of PopCap, where we had the luxury of three-year development cycles, um, I knew I wasn't going to have that, and I knew we weren't going to be able to build a, you know, the next great game mechanic. And so the, the idea that you know, the I, poker or slot game mechanic is not something that has to be recreated, um, a little naively walking into it thinking that slot games are super simple to build, 
Uh, and my friend Jim out here taught us that uh, we, we didn't know what we didn't know in those early days uh, as we started to get real money game content into our world. Uh, but it was, it was Social Casino really for the, the understanding of the, the core mechanic uh, and we could build a metagame around that and I knew we could do that well. And then on the publishing side? So on publishing, we, we always intended to be a publisher. That was what I was going to bring to the group. So the, they were developers and they were usually working with other publishers, but we always were going to be a publisher. We just used Big Fish where we could and where it made sense. Perfect. And in terms of, you know, you just kind of alluded to, to Jim and his expertise on the real money side, how much, so obviously your real money experience was somewhat limited when you got into this industry. On uh, Daniel, on your side, how much real, real money experience did you have and how important was that in what you kind of brought to the equation? So. If, firstly, my, my real money experience uh, started on 1999, uh, both from a primarily casino uh, development and operations and also bingo. Uh, so how, it, to answer your question, and I did that for uh, effectively the last 17 years. Um, now, it, with respect to the advantages it provided us uh, and looking at it, the, the social side is, is very much uh, based on analytics. Uh, the driver of, of the revenues is really the focal points of your app itself and the technology you're building and this player experience more than anything else. And they're not as heavily dependent on the supplementary services that are uh, otherwise found within the real money. So if I were to uh, say that you know any advantage we brought in or we noticed anything is that in a, in a maturing market or in a competitive market, um, applying the strategies with respect to player development, whether it be CRM or appropriate VIP management, all the processes that otherwise we had to endure and learn through the uh, experience of having to operate a real money gaming uh, entertainment, applying those strategies within the realm of a social, we saw a tremendous amount of increased results. Gotcha. And, and K. How has your thinking about uh, you know real money concepts or or real money math? How has that evolved since you've kind of released your game? Yeah, uh, I think that's really a very you know the, the essential part of a social casino. Actually, um, so the main purpose of our game is to bringing the feeling of Vegas or a casino floor to users. So by playing the same kind of mechanics or uh, mass model, so that's kind of uh, really helpful to players to retain. So uh, in the beginning, you know, you can lure players with you know nice graphics or uh, like IP or you know good meta game, but uh, eventually you know they will need to spin and spin and again. So it's all about real money feeling that, that they are craving. Yeah. Okay. So. Let's uh, you know, talk a little bit about strategy, a little bit about real money. In terms of, of the, the game itself and, and the platforms, focus, mobile, desktop, Facebook, where are you guys right now? Uh, we are only mobile, only developer, yes. And you, do you intend to stay that way? Uh, kind of, because we are really small studio, and um, yes. Daniel? So with respect to the two acquisitions that we were now, it's all consolidated into one company uh, and operated by the Akamon Group uh, called Tangelo now, uh, they're both strengths have been from the portal and web. Uh, from a technical point of view and from an operational point of view or from a user's point of view, uh, once we dug in, we had a strategy of simply transition into mobile. I know it's an easy thing that many people say, and we had, you know, we had acquired two companies which collectively have over 50 million of registered users, so a, a great deal of, uh, you know, a user base to, to approach, and so we were of the opinion that we just simply need to transition what's already worked on, on desktop over to mobile. Uh, that's when the challenges uh, begin to arise, uh, that the player experience fundamentally is different uh, 
from that of a mobile user versus that of a desktop user. And, and to simply put, as a, I think you and I had a discussion on this, um, the player sessions on, on, on desktop are much longer traditionally. And while our Israeli co had done a tremendous job of, of tailoring and fostering a player base that was hugely successful and very, very profitable, but those player base, that player base was accustomed to player sessions in excess of an hour. That was simply not possible to maintain within the realm of a mobile app, uh, where you typically see uh, smaller player sessions uh, in many or multiple times during the day. So that created a bit of a challenge in terms of player experience, where you need to develop almost something completely different in terms of an experience for the player that, that comes through mobile versus desktop. At least we found it that way. Now, is there? A, a happy medium that 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 lends itself well to both sides. Yes, we do see. I mean, some of the reports show that you know some companies that have done a, a, either Playtica or Double Down that have a, a similar uh, percentage of revenue split between mobile and uh, and desktop. But historically, from what our experiences have been, is if you want to expand within mobile, you either or, or become the jack of trade in that sector and, and you, you really focus on that demographic or that user base. And if you're going to uh, try and achieve success in the desktop side or website, um, our recommendation from my own experience is to try and not wear two hats but look at it separately and individually and, and kind of attack that animal differently. So in, in terms of development challenges, you know, for, for, for me, it's really been trying to do real-time multiplayer versus simply a single-player game. And that's been our biggest development challenge across the board, regardless of whether it was you know, desktop, Facebook, or mobile. Now, Michael, you've got a, a pretty big team behind you. What would you say early on your biggest development challenges were, and kind of how has that changed today? Well, actually, the, the first game that I challenged the team to build was a multiplayer one-minute poker tournament. Uh, so we, ha we had to tackle the multiplayer experience right from the very beginning. And it really surprised me how well they did it, because I know at PopCap that was, a, that was like, you know, roadmap two years down the line. Yep. So um, we, we tackled it early. Um, you know, there are technologies out there that help you do that. And we jumped on one of those very in the in the very early days, and that continues to be our multiplayer engine that we use for bingo and poker tournaments and everything else. And, and is that something like SmartFox or, yeah. or some other yeah. tool? SmartFox. Okay. So, multiplayer, it, it's it's an inherent part of bingo. Uh, if you can't call balls at the same time with every all the participants seeing the calls at the same time of various places in the world, you really don't have the game. Uh, so what I can speak to that is, is, is we've successfully overcome that. My team that I've worked with for many, many years at every different juncture, we've, we've over been able to successfully overcome that and produce a uh, synchronous multiplayer game that, that was successful and that spoke to the success of the bingo apps itself. But at every juncture, uh, let's say mid-2000s or the challenges we had uh, with internet latency and all the issues that we had to overcome at that point, propelled us or, or to, to develop a different set of technologies in order to overcome the issues at that point in time, which often created limitations as to all the things we'd like to do. Um, I can tell you that today, obviously, with the advancements and many things, I mean, people are now talking about Node.js or SmartFox or many other types of approaches or utilization of different technologies that are available. Um, I think that we're in a much better place that you know, I dare say, you know, some of the projects that I'm involved with now, and I can tell you that, you know, delivering massive mul synchronous multiplayer game uh, on a 3G phone is something I could only dream of 10 years ago, but uh, but it's now possible. So I'm excited about the uh, what, what's happening today. Okay. Yeah, actually, the first game we ever developed was, uh, you know, PvP uh, shooter puzzle game. So it's a multiplayer uh, battle between two person. Yeah, and um, it was kind of successful in Korean market. And uh, when we first started to start uh, casino games, the only legacy we could 
you know, used from our you know previous experience was to make it multiplayer game. So we did it. <laughs> right. And, and in terms of the gameplay itself in, in your game, when you, when it first launched, kind of like, what's the biggest difference between when it first launched and today in terms of the gameplay? Uh, we only had four to five slots contents there, yep. but now we have around like 40 released. So yes, the the most differences are the you know the quantity of the contents. Okay, so it's it's content and quantity. Yes. Daniel. So, in 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 our uh, in our what uh, what we've seen basically um, um, to date is uh, at the very beginning we we, we had the multiplayer games. Um, the, the challenges that we had at that time were were basically how do we you know as I mentioned before uh, getting the, uh, uh, the, the the synchronous games to be played out at the same time so we, we package everything and bring it. Michael just in, in terms of content content king so that's probably been the biggest change for us so adding Konami this month you know that was a big win for us yeah. as, a, as a company. So both genre expansion uh, and probably most interestingly is putting all the different genres of individual game apps that we had into a consolidated casino, which we did first for Trop World, for Tropicana. And it's, it's interesting because when, normally when we start talking about you know, kind of the importance of branded games, we're talking about the importance of the slot machines within our apps. In, in your case, you now have a partner with a brand. How does that kind of change things in, in, for you in all kinds of ways? Sorry. Um, you mean partner as in Konami or partner as in Tropicana? In, as like in Tropicana, okay. in Konami, like actual, well, really Tropicana. Yeah, so the, you know, the, the goal there was to uh, utilize a great brand that has a, a, a wide reach, um, a great audience that has been developed in their database for, for many years, uh, and really try to act like we're the in-house development studio for Tropicana. So we, we came up with the look and feel, the whole, like, what should it look like, how should it play, what does it represent in their brand, what is the history of their brand, and how can we make that game for them. And uh, so that's been, it's been great for them, great for us. Uh, we did the same thing with Lucky North Casino for Del Delaware North, uh, and we're doing the same thing for Pachanga as well. And in terms of the, the advantages of a branded machine like a Konami or like any other popular brand, have you seen a measurable uh, increase in retention, a measurable increase in monetization, or is it really on the user acquisition side that it is its biggest advantage? It, it, it helps in all aspects. So uh, one of our best games is multi-strike poker, which has you know, been on the casino floors for 13 years and played by many millions of people. Uh, and that's really, you know, it's a great monetizer, it's a great engagement, uh, it's great for UA. Uh, the Konami content, of course, is some of the best slot games in the world, and and that's only going to help. Uh, but even uh, you know some of the, the content we have from Blue Hair, and you know it's it's high quality, real money game studio developed content, which really does make a difference. Five years ago, it probably wouldn't have, but today it certainly does. And Kay and, and Daniel, are you making efforts to? find brands or create relationships with brands or somehow play off brands? Uh, not for us. Yeah, we are not that big. So uh, we can't afford the luxury of having it in the game. So with respect to branding uh, uh, games, so look, there's obviously a natural uh, question to be asked whether or not the royalties uh, or the obligations that you 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 take on with 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 you know getting into any contract uh, with respect to a branded game, whether it be slots or anything else, uh, whether or not it'll have you know longevity with that, or to what extent it'll be profitable, or if in fact it will be it be sustainable. Um, while uh, we we looked at it, we've looked at it quite uh, closely. And while there seems to be a credit, quite a bit of advantages, especially in the player acquisition side, 
um, we've we we've we've opted that having the initial brand of the casino, like Bass Casino, and, and having the user base in which we tailor to a specific demographic, we felt that we're still able to do without it. So, so that's, uh, that's kind of been the strategy with Impress. Level lock, VIP lock, no lock. What do you guys think about locking content within your apps? You wanna yeah, I'll, I'll go on this one. So the... The, one of the natural game mechanics that exist is, is progression, and unlocking is just simply helping you do that. It's a mechanic that, that gives you that. So we've tried it both ways. Uh, it's a hard balance. Um, you want to unlock the content that people want to play, but you want to keep it out there as a carrot for them to, to unlock to make the, you know, the journey and the, the player journey um, with, with some purpose. So we, we lock uh, both VIP and we lock levels only in the slot world. We were open in poker. Okay. Yes, uh, we do have uh, functionality to lock by level and tier and whatever they have. But um, yes, so we are testing many different you know competitions of it and over time and looking for some you know solution. But we are not yet there yet. But yeah, we were trying to lock and unlock it, and you know we are trying to give it all to you know for free. And sometimes you know we just lock and we unlock. So yeah, so there's no absolute solution or answer for that. But we are trying to find something better you know, if it helps uh, on our KPIs. So so you mentioned testing. So in, in terms of A/B testing, what is the single biggest thing or most impactful thing that you've learned from A-B testing your app? Go out on a limb. The single most important thing is you have to test. That's <laughs> the learning I learned. Michael? For us, it's cart design, but I'm not going to tell you the answer. It's <laughs> Daniel? So, Regarding the game locking, um, I, I think everybody will agree. It's, 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 it's really something everyone just dabbles in, tries it out. Uh, some people lock some games, some they don't. And on certain days, they want to unlock everything. Outside of this great deal of panic that creates in, our, in the development teams, where if you're unlocking all the games, you're going to have really a lot of potential issues with delivery of content and content development. Outside of that, really, I think the underlying uh, efforts behind it is really to test the waters at every juncture to see whether or not you can a retain your players and keep them coming back and b keep your ROI and keep your uh, um, ARPDAO at a, at, a, at a healthy and reasonable level and improvement. So to, 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 to your point uh, regarding uh, whether or not there is a real, you know, anything any particular person would do, I think I would say that uh, all the companies that have been involved in on a constant basis tries different approaches at every different level for that pursuit. Um, regarding A-B testing, I think it's a, it's on paper and in theory, it's a phenomenal approach to, to the extent that um, it is actually utilized. It, 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 it's a question. Uh, I'd like to see a heck of a lot more of it, basically. And, um, and I think that to some degree, most companies today, including ours, uh, all that I've been involved in, it deploys that. Uh, the approach. Okay, in, in terms of the evolution of your games, you've kind of seen an arc from when you started to, to where you are today. Where are the next changes coming from for you in your games? What do you think will actually, you know, kind of move the needle? So, for me personally, um, you know, having, uh, I think the, the two companies that we've built now, um, have their path and, and, and it's more operational and meeting uh, investor targets and revenue targets and whatnot. And, and, and part of the reason I've been looking at kind of different ventures and different ideas is that, is that you start to question whether or not there'll be any dramatic or significant uh, new uh, ventures or new ideas that will propel this particular industry that we're in into the next level. And I only say that because of 
my admiration of the new technologies that are coming in and my view that I think over the next three years there will be a transition into more and more people holding on to VR headsets or the, uh, the introduction of uh, um, chatbots or the various different ways where the experience of players can be enhanced and improved. And so that type of approach, if one is to keep in mind, will require significant uh, strategic ch either change or investment, and which, uh, which is something that, that I'm excited about, if you will, as far as the next phase of growth is concerned. Michael, in, in terms of, of your company's innovation and, and where you're looking to take the, the gameplay? So uh, gameplay or, or just actually distribution opportunities, we're looking at um, obviously with, with Delaware North, they're a very, very large company with a large footprint and half a billion customers a year uh, managing sports stadiums and things like that. I think there's some really great opportunities we can, we can do there. It's one of the reasons that we put trivia uh, in a social casino uh, to try to tie into that in a, in a way that long term is going to make sense. Maybe it doesn't make sense today. Uh, and then I think we've got some really interesting stuff with casino integrations where uh, we're getting tighter and tighter uh, with the land-based casinos on rewards and on property um, promotions that kind of close the loop of bringing the player from the casino to the social and the social back. And, and Kay, the innovation on your side? Uh, yeah, so uh, probably adding more games. <laughs> <laughs> You're playing it very safe. It must be people in the audience. Ten minutes. Uh, okay, so why don't we, let's see if we can ask one, one more question uh, just in terms of what, well, you guys have sort of touched on where you think the industry is going, Daniel, with a little bit touching Jump on VR head, yeah. or, 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 or AR. Let's have so you want to talk about, okay, so a more pragmatic uh, approach for existing businesses. Um, I, I, see, I see a little, you know, at every juncture localization has been uh, something that's uh, been interpreted differently and a lot of the companies with different approaches have seen a great deal of success through various varied successes on that approach. I think that it, the war or the term localization is a very broad uh, term that applies to many things beyond, you know, language, currency, or content specific to a jurisdiction. I think with the enhancements and improvements in technology, we're likely to see a lot of more location-based games and 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 games that really define the experience for the player on a more dynamic basis within the regions or the cultural effects they have. And I'll and in, with respect to content. Uh, while we're still seeing some of the big entities or the larger entities generating significant amount of revenue on some of the main titles or branded titles, which I still think there is a lot of room for improvement where uh, localized content can really play a significant role in increasing or profitability or revenues for companies. A great example of it is a friend of mine whose name I won't mention, um, with a great set of slot machines, done incredibly well in in the US. Uh, however, uh, of recent took a decision to develop slots within the German market of that that's more prevalent like Gausermann or other companies that are more uh, uh, familiar with the audience. Um, results inside of 60 days has been approximately 80% improvement in his revenues just on the content alone. So that's a testament to where I think uh, more development will be headed and, and where the new ideas will come out of. Okay, and before we get into more questions, why don't we touch on one of the original questions. Kay, you, you started out kind of with that concept of bringing uh, not so much Asian games, but an Asi Asian philosophy and mechanics to the West. Can you expand on that a little more in, in some detail and talk about whether or not you would go in the other direction from West into Asia? Okay. Uh you know, last year, uh, one of the Korean social casino company called W Games IPO'd in Korea at the valuation over $1 billion, and it's crazy. And there were another uh, Chinese company IPO'd in Hong Kong and valued over $2 billion. And these numbers uh, sounds really crazy and fishy, but it's happening in Asia. And there are tons of, at least I know about two dozens of 
small uh, studios and big studios uh, like the companies you work with before uh, you know trying to aiming you know American or the Western social casino market and so th there are many tries you know and if you look at you know whenever I met the people here in casual connect or in you know America they always said oh the Asia is a blue ocean and there's empty spaces out there and we will we should go there we should conquer there but if you go to Asia and if you go to China Korea Japan and they always say oh this is too crowded and it's already blue ocean you know the America look at the America that's the, you know land of the promise and we should go there <laughs> so it's always happening and we don't know much about you know the market here and you guys don't have any clue about the market there so it's they always think you know the other way is much easier so but the revolution or uh, some kind of innovation comes out of these differences so I believe there should be some some other companies from Asia will do some better jobs here in the States and also with that approach uh, there must be some day when uh, you know the Asian social casino market is booming because it's if you go there it's, there's almost nothing about social casino yet but if you look at the casinos in Macau, Philippines, you know Korea, Japan, you know Singapore there are so many people crowded in there and the industry there is much bigger than here in <sighs> Vegas and the gaming itself like mobile and social gaming you know, I, I read an article today that iOS market of China today, you know, is bigger than here in the States. So there must be some opportunity, but no one cracked in yet. So there will be some chance. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. For you. <laughs> Other questions? Uh, just to touch a little bit about the Asian market, uh, a bit more, I mean, isn't part of the reason that uh, Social Casino is having a hard time in Asia just player preferences regarding slots, uh, slots not being prevailing enough in Asia as a game genre? Uh, yeah, that, that's uh, true. And uh, actually, if you go to, you know, Macau or Korean, you know, Chinese, or in you know, the Philippine casinos, and the most of the players are playing baccarat because the players there, to, you know, in Asian players they go to a casino to earn money. They actually believe they can earn money, and they make it their job. But if you go to a casino here in Vegas, you know, people there are just for party and drinking and playing, you know, some silly games. So the mentality is a little different. So actually there are a few Asian social casino companies getting really successful in the Asian market, but they are you know, somewhere between real money and you know, social. So the, it's kind of fish area, but uh, many companies are doing it. But there are many tries and uh, like, you know, the companies are trying to do build something which is uh, totally legal but can benefit players so um, probably you know we can find some solution there other questions okay I'd like to thank the panelists